Hi guys, my name is Dr. Foy, and we're on the show called Full Current. Let's make some noise. No be half current, now wait in. Now Full Current. So, the Nigerian creative economy is at its peak. Music is now exports. Nollywood is, for me, the biggest startup ever in Africa. And there's, there's someone who has done this for over 30 years. He's seen three decades of the Nigerian entertainment industry. He wears a cap like he's a king. He's a Liverpool fan, and right now we don't know if they're losing because there's a live match going on here. For me, he's the guy with the full current, the full scope of the creative ecosystem in Nigeria. Let's put your hands together for Obi King Asika. <laughs> thank you, thank you. But, but sorry, Obi, are you, are, you, are you royalty? Well, yeah, actually. <laughs> no, not, not sincerely. Well, listen, I mean, I'm from Onesha, right? And, you know, um, my, my clan is Umu Eza Roli, which is the children of Eza Roli, the King Aroli, who in many, in the Onesha tradition, is one of the key kings that really formed the city. And, you know, in Onesha, our mythology is that we, we, um, we, we were in the kingdom of Benin, right, about in the 15th century. And there was an altercation between the Oba son and our people, and we left. And, and if, you, if you drive today from Benin to Onitsha, on the road, there are many Onitshas before you get to the Oh, serious? Onitsha. Oh, yes, 100%. Because you can imagine if you're, if you're separating, maybe you run 10 kilometers, and you stop, and you settle, and you think, OK, I'm far enough away to be safe. But maybe these people are pursuing you, right? Because it's territorial, it's, you know, it's conflict. And they kept going, and they kept settling in different places. And maybe this happened over 50, 60 years. But then they got to the River Niger, and Eze Chima, who's the founder of Onitsha, crossed the road. And there you get Onitsha. Onitsha Mili is actually what it's called, which is Onitsha by the water. Now, the interesting thing is that you know, in Nigeria, we get stuck on all these lines about tribe and ethnicity. I'm from Onitsha. Onitsha is very similar to every port city in the sense that the indigents are the minority, right? So in Onitsha, we that are actually from Onitsha are less than 10% oh, wow. of the population, right? Because the people that come there, they come from the interior to the water where the Onitsha is. That's the Anambra people, the people from I'm Maine. Anambra. Uh -huh. So you come to Onitsha, to the water, and that's why there's a market there, because there's a port. And that market is the biggest in West Africa. I think 60% of Nigerian imports go from, to Onitsha. Wow. Yeah, they go to Onitsha for distribution, right? And what then happens is, but think about this. So people would say ordinarily, oh, Onitsha is an Igbo yeah. city, right? It's an Anambra state, one of the biggest commercial cities in the country. But ancestrally, Onitsha has nine ancestral villages. Nine? Yes. So, Obi, how do you know all these things? I'm a student of life. Huh. Yeah. It's, it's, now, it's, now, just to pull you for that, mm -hmm. are you the first son in your house? Yes. Good. So you're the first son in an Igbo man's land royalty. <laughs> and you're doing entertainment. Oh, you yes. didn't do medicine. You didn't do medicine. No, no, no. Listen, I studied law. Right. So you're a lawyer? Of course. So don't get it twisted. I mean... <laughs> But the thing is this, is that everybody's perception comes from their education and their background. So I come from a situation where my parents were academics who found themselves in public office. But in reality, what that meant was they brought, they brought to public office with their own sensibilities, their own, you know, um, intellectualism. Yeah, and that, concept and, and, and in their, frameworks. Yeah, and in there, I've grown up talking about soft power, but not understanding that that's what my father was doing in his own work. But in those days, it wasn't yet named soft power. Some Harvard professor had not coined the phrase. But what he was doing in his daily work, when I think about it today, is using soft power, right? Because soft power is when you don't have the military industrial complex. That's hard power. That's hard power. Yeah, but soft power is, depending how you look at it, is diplomacy, it's culture, it's music. It's the it's, Colosseum. Yeah, it's literature. Literature. The things that today we call the creative economy they come with soft power. So for you, the end goal of the creative economy is, is power? Well, it's, Control. Well, it's like this. If you look at it like this, if you're a human being and you're just a, a consumer of culture, 
think about this. The Cold War between Russia and America that defined maybe the last 50 years of the 20th century. How did it end? It didn't end in a, in a battle. It didn't end in bombs and rockets. It ended because the Germans, the East Germans, wanted to be West Germans. They, they wanted to have McDonald's. They wanted to have that lifestyle. They were chasing the Levi jeans, the McDonald's. So that desire was more powerful than any desire to remain communist, right? And that's what won the Cold War. Today in Russia, Russia has generated some of the richest people in the world, right? Because the human nature of progression in that sense. So in a way, communism has been put aside. That philosophy has died with the 20th century. And you now have a new different form of state driven capitalism or state driven power. But soft power, the Brazilian football team, Shakespeare. Premiership, EPL. Of course. See what Saudi is doing. Saudi is Saudi's buying everybody just to have control. Now. But is it control or to, have, to, be, to be relevant? It's not control because. Let but, me tell but, you why. but with the relevance, they can shape culture, shape mindset, shape. Well, I think it's like this. Like, like Africa, the difference is this, is that the Arabs, driven by Saudi Arabia, but started by Qatar and the UAE, yeah. with Manchester City and PSG, you know, and bringing Formula One to those markets, and they were both following Dubai. This is all about making yourself central in global economic. Okay. So at the end of the day, Dubai spent a lot of money, but how much money goes to Dubai every year? A lot. Tourism, a lot. right? So everybody else in that region is chasing that same money. Saudi's chasing it, Abu Dhabi's chasing it, and you see the different tactics. Saudi has said, we're gonna globalize everybody, all Arabian culture, by participating in global culture. So what you see in football is very small. They spent $40 billion in esports. So, $40 billion? Yes, yes. And so they're buying the ecosystems, they're investing into the games, the leagues, so, the competition. So if we're gonna do it based on returns, they may not make the money back. Mm -hmm. So what is why are they doing it? If you're spending forty on, on e-games, a hundred on football. Because because they're making a bet that esports is going to be worth a trillion dollars per annum in the next five years, and they will own thirty percent of the industry. So every year they're doing three hundred billion dollars. Suddenly forty billion dollars looks like some more money. Okay. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh -huh. So they're not doing anything random. It's long term. They, huh? they put two billion dollars into football. They won the World Cup in twenty thirty. The football rights by 2030. Qatar spent how much? $400 billion to host the World Cup yeah. in one city. It's not like normal World Cups in multiple countries. In a city? In one city, basically. Why do they do that? That's, that is the whole projection of soft power. When you're saying, at the end of the World Cup, you saw Messi lift the World Cup, right? What happened? A local chief came and put a thing on him, right? That's pushing the culture right bang in the middle. A billion five hundred million people saw that together suddenly becomes mainstream your kid suddenly thinks oh okay that's it's nice. cool it's cool yeah whereas 30 years ago you were taught that was separate it was lesser the arab thing was not as strong as the western thing so if you grew up in africa the same way that sometimes southerners in nigeria talk down to northerners in nigeria is the same idea that islam is somehow lesser than christianity or the arabs are lesser than the that's what it's all about so people spend their money to let you know we're all on the same level. Get it. Africa's looking for that. We're looking to do the same Get thing. It. Now, you've, you've touched the sports industry now in, in, in Nigeria. You've touched the... Uh, have you touched Nollywood? A little bit. I mean, no. I would say yes. I but mean, music, I, so music and sports. A lot of other things, but for you, the purposes of this, television. I mean, television, all television. All the biggest reality. Radio. Radio, radio, I would say I have associations with some of the biggest guys in radio. In radio, okay. And people who've built... I mean, you know, Chris Obossi is a dear friend of mine, and I've followed him for 30 years as he built what he built. First, that we're launching Cool FM and Wajobia FM, uh, Nigeria The Info. ecosystem. That's one big song. And then with Beat FM, Tajuddin with Sound City. These are pillars, right? The Bird, Silver Bird. So you've got to look at the fact that you've got to give Babangida credit. He is the person who deregulated Nigerian broadcasting in 91 or 92. And that actually is a big moment that pushes forward everything. So if you look at the big moments, deregulation of broadcasting, because Nollywood is born out of the frustration of not being able to get onto television. Wow. Yeah, because they couldn't. NTA was not going to give you a commission. Even till today, our TV industry 
is messed up because of the model that we operate. And TV should be the biggest segment of our industry. But the truth of the matter is, at the time, it was government controlled, it was public sector run, it was limited creativity, and sometimes you can't regulate creativity. So if you're stuck in a mode where you think this is the only way in which we do something, then that's what ends up happening. So just so let's start with music, mm -hmm. and then we do sports, and then we do now with music. Give me three in your in your in the run you've been. Give me three key moments in our industry that has changed the pattern, so we can predict the future. Three moments in your time. Only three. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot. I mean, I think from my personal perspective. Yeah. Um, things I've been directly involved, I've been involved in a lot of stuff. But if I think about seminal moments, I think this, the second time, not the first time. I was gonna say the first time I saw Junior and Pretty, I think the second time. Junior and Pretty? Yeah, I think the second time I saw them. The first time I saw them, they showed up, we were producing a show called Clapperboard Weekend Raps. Clapperboard Television was the first private TV channel in Nigeria. And we were producing this show that used to run on Saturdays. And Jimmy Jack, was the DJ, Olisa Dubois was the host. Wow. No, he was producing and directing. Jimmy is the DJ. A guy called A Block, another brother living off crime, was an MC, who's now a multimillionaire in London, was the host. And he was a rapper. He was part of a crew called um, Tribe of Troubadours. So we used to have rappers come. We used to shoot in a place called Sizzlers and VI. So the rappers will come and audition for us before we let them on the show, right? And the first time Junior Pretty showed up, these guys are rapping in American accents. I couldn't work out what they were saying. I was like, I said, bro, I mean, please, where did you come from? You know, <laughs> guys said like, oh, it's that's me, it's me. I'm telling you, man. The guy said he came from my Jagun I said, so <laughs> this, all these AK-47 you're rapping about, I mean, they've never seen an AK-47. I said, it doesn't make no sense. So well, calm down, small. how did you get here? I said, he jumped bus somewhere, he jumped bike somewhere. <laughs> I said, you know something? I said, if you rap about that, there's more chance that people pay attention because people jump bus. Everybody in Lagos will understand what you're rapping about. And then adjust your accent, come down. <laughs> but it was just more like conversation. It wasn't- Condescending. No, no, no. Maybe it was, I don't even know. Okay. But, but it was just feedback. Like guys, but they were disappointed. You know, they've come all the way, they got their, they've got their big audition. And we have to say yes or no, you're going on TV. And we're like, there's no way you're going on TV. And we were shooting once a month. So they don't know whether we're ever going to let them audition okay. again. Or the... So the next time we, we had a shoot, they came. And, you know, we're auditioning again. And the guy gets on stage. And Junior, unfortunately, is late now. But Pretty is still alive. And the guy gets on stage. And the guy starts going, he says something like, PLC, chop my money, PLC. And I'm like, I said, wait a second. Where's this melody coming from, right? And these guys had three songs done. Pigeon English, hooks, verses, and they were funny. I mean, to the extent that we had actually recorded an entire album with a guy called Nodine, who was, we were positioning Nodine to take out Blackie. Blackie was like the superstar. So, and Blackie was a friend of mine, you know? So I'm like, I said, call him and said, Blackie, man, I got somebody. <laughs> we're gonna take you out. Blackie's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's on Premier Records. Premier Records is like Nigeria. Sonia Day. Yeah, I mean, Premier had everybody. Premier and Sony Music were big labels. You know, they were big money labels. We were running Storm out of like, I mean, out of nothing, out of air, right? <laughs> so we go and beg these guys to give us a distribution deal. And Mrs. Okunuwa, who was the MD of uh, Sony, who's a legend in Nigerian music, she just laughed. She's like, what's the kind of music you're doing? And I'm like, and she was the licensee for Def Jam Records, right? CBS and Def Jam, they had them. So they had, you know, Big Daddy Kane. They had Public Enemy, LL Cool J. Uh, wow. But they were not releasing any of the music into Nigeria. So I'm freaking out. I'm like, you've got all these artists. You're not releasing them. So who's going to buy it? But you know what? They had Shino Peters, Adewale Ayuba. They were killing it. Mike Okri. So as far as they were concerned, this thing people are talking about, it's like, it's just gist, right? But you know, we're crazy enough. We went anyway. We went to the Sony distributor, who was a lady, I can't remember her name, Mrs. Okoye, in Malu Road, in our papa. Went in there and we ordered 30,000 cassettes. 
almost had a heart attack even thinking about it. I'm just going to do these cassettes. But we sold out. We sold 350,000 cassettes. Of Junior and Pretty? Yeah, the first album. And you know the funniest thing? They probably sold 4 million because we had no control. And <laughs> this thing was, the thing was showing up in like 15 countries. Wow. But those boys, we released them on their contract to Premier Records for their second album. And then they toured for five years in West Africa. Junior and Pretty. Oh, yeah, they made their money. And the thing about it is that the first rappers in Pigeon, all that, Junior stuff, and Pretty. all that stuff they did is like a blueprint. So if you're listening to anybody today who's rapping, who's putting the Pigeon into the language, using the hip hop beats, that's wow. the foundation of Afrobeats, right? Wow. That's before Remedies, it's before, before all those guys. Partition Boys. Ten, eight years before. Junior and Pretty is 1991, 1992. Do you understand? That's 31 years ago. Yeah. So, do you know pretty first? Next moment? Next moment. For, Afro, for, for Nigerian music, I think, I think, I think it's, the advert, it's the arrival of Two-Face. I think so, too. I think it's the arrival of Two-Face. I think Two-Face so two face, two face, so two is, is a different kind of artist, right? And I think when people tell the story of Nigerian music, if you don't talk about Two-Face, you weren't here, you don't understand. I mean, all the other artists were looking up to Two-Face. So you wouldn't say Plantation Boys, you say Two-Face. No, it's Two-Face. I mean, Plantation Boys were nice. It's like Style Plus. They're nice. They're doing their thing. Tribes are better doing their thing, OK? Idris Abdul Karim is a very important artist in this it, time. In this, in this time. Tony Tetula. There's a bunch of these guys. What Kenneth's music is doing is critical, because AIT jams, all these things are happening, and they're bringing a lot of energy that people haven't seen before. So then you have the guys coming from Abuja, Mode 9, Overdose. There's a tall guy. And what's his name again? Six foot plus. Six foot plus, that's man. My, that's my guy. That's my guy. He from don't 90, do it me. From 91. Wow. I've known him since 91. So the energy of the movement is coming like that. LD is beginning to become important. Utilize. Tribesmen. Tribesmen. And LD with the videos changed the game. He went into the street markets in Alaba with a guy called Tijo. Right? Tijo... If you ever were buying music in those days, this guy used to be called um, Biz Bob, Biz Big Boss Jigger Man. Uh, Alaba. Yeah, that's TJ. <laughs> <laughs> those guys controlled the stuff. They were making the money. We were just creating the, the content. Yeah, yeah, but we weren't seeing any money back. Do you understand? So, 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 so we killed that. <laughs> and then the last, the third, not the last, but the third. So we you have Junior Pretty, Two Face, and that era. Then the bands. Bangui! Yeah, of course. I mean, listen, the bands, right? Because the band is coexisting with Two Face, right? Who is, to me, eternal, and P Square, who come from Joss and change the energy. When we first saw P Square, it was like, it was like seeing Twin Usher, right? And they were kind of doing R and B, you know, their first time out. Then they tweaked their sound and went into this kind of high life slash R and B with the dancing and the energy, and they just took over Africa. It is P-Square that were first being flown around in private jets. P-Square? Of course. Heads of state in Africa. P-Square, listen, when people were not able to charge two and a half million, P-Square were charging 10 million. So you know what? You're going to hold that 10 million. We'll go on a break, <laughs> and I'll be right back. Still on full current. See you soon. Mm. Wow. Am I boring you guys? No. <laughs> <laughs> wow. P-Square. Man, listen, P Square, you know, I learned some of these stuff I don't even want to say them. P Square, will tell, Jude will tell you. Okay, so P Square. I, I, I would never have told you. P Square? Private Jet. P Square? No, Whiskey. P Square. Who's, listen, man, Whiskey is, Whiskey is five years after. No, no, but, but PJs. Listen, it's now social media. Let me tell you, All right? P Square, Jude used to say, the biggest artists were getting three million, maybe five. Nah. Yeah. Ain't nobody getting three million dollars even now, so don't let them yeah, lie yeah, to yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. But three million naira was big money in then. 2008. It was big money. P Square, Jude will tell you, P Square is 10 million. Whether it's five minutes performance, two hour performance, <laughs> whether it's in your house, in the club, <laughs> or in the stadium, or that, it's 10 million. It's P Square. And P Square, you know, Listen, P Square were not in the clubs. They didn't have the lifestyle. P Square were in the gym. They're at home working out, training, 
when you see them on stage, they give you two and a half hours of high energy. And they don't miss. It's nothing like, oh, they missed a song, they had an off day. Those ones, uh, these people were doing 80,000 people in stadiums in 2009. Kenya, Zambia, Uganda, Sierra Leone, Liberia, like that, for a good seven years. So, yeah. If people, anybody that doesn't understand, doesn't understand. I mean, Peace Corps will sell out the O2 this year if they, if they focus on that as an objective, they will do it because- They will do it. Yeah, because the three big, the three biggest artists in our era, Two-Face, Peace Corps- The Bunch. The Bunch. The Bunch's energy changes the game totally. Um, but it's the Bunch with Mo Hits, with Jazzy, with One Day Cold, The Prince. It's a movement, just understand that. Moments, moments. The dynamic, that's why I said the third one is, are we on? No, we're not no, on. We're not on yet. Yeah. Three minutes. The, the third one is... Um, Three minutes, great. Okay. The third one is uh, Oliver Twist. Oliver, yeah. Because it, it's also, it's a Kanye massive West moment for the culture, but it's a separation between the bands and jazz, Jazzy. So that's why it's very important, because Jazzy had to go and rebuild. It's Mavens, right? The bands went his direction. Let me check scores for you. Let me break your heart. Yeah. Please. Give me, give me, let my heart. Tell me good news, man. Let me break your heart, bruv. He wants to break my heart. Is, is your husband a Chelsea supporter? No, man, that's not fun. She so doesn't care. He just wants to give me pain. 1-1. 1-1. One, one. One, one. Who scored for us? Salah? Let me check. It's still first half. 1-1. One, one. Who scored? Diaz. Who scored first? They both scored first. Who equalized? What's his name? Okay. It's a new player. It's a new player. It's a 1-1. One, one. First half over. Now, wow. Uh, seven minutes. It's a seven minutes. Um, um, they're still in half time. Yeah. It's still on. Seven minutes, like, extra time. Oh, the first, first half. half. Yeah. Neymar is going to Alaleo. Wouldn't you go? Hmm? Wouldn't you go? What? 75 per year? I'll go now. I'm not giving him. What's 75? Not even a conversation now. Yeah. It's not difficult. These are not hard decisions. At all. If you, give me, if you, give, me, if you give me that money, I'll abandon my entire family legacy history. <laughs> People start speaking Arabian by force, man. So they're going to buy out Neymar's contract. From PSG. From PSG and give him a deal of $175 million. I'll go now. Of course. Also, you have to understand, this is a flex. Saudi Arabia, Qatar flex. PSG is Qatar. Saudi is taking everybody. Because what Saudi is basically saying is, ah, so you think Qatar can host the World Cup and we will just be the country people. You know, Saudi is a big country. It's not, it's like Nigeria. You can fly three, two hours internal from city to city. Saudi? Yeah. It's not like Qatar. That's a very, that's a city state. Qatar is a city state like Dubai, like Abu Dhabi. Saudi is, is a, you can fly two hours inside Saudi. So they're planning. They've spent, they, they, they're going to spend a hundred billion dollars yes. building their infrastructure for football. Qatar. Qatar spent 400 billion. On World Cup. Yeah. What else did they spend the money? Would you even know where Qatar is? Huh? But it's, it's it's wild. That's we'll Africa's economy. Uh, well, Africa's economy should be much more. I hear you. I hear you. Okay. And we're back to full current. Now, the idea of this, of this show is full concept, full conversations. Really not have big conversations. Go from the past to the present and the present to the future. So back to Peace Corps, 10 million. Yeah, yeah. Private jet. So they were the guys. Listen, man. Peace Corps, there's a true story. True story. 
Akon told me himself, not theoretical, not third Akon party. told you? Oh, yeah. Akon was booked to do some show in East Africa. It's around 2008, eight nine, And he had a conflict. He had, like, two bookings literally the same day. It's going to make it difficult for him to make that particular show. And they paid him a lot of money. It's like either New Year's Eve, December 31st, December 30th kind of situation. So he's trying to work out, okay, what can I do to keep, give you guys a substitute for me, right? That can maintain the same level of interest. Because in those days, typically, it wasn't the companies paying for the artists. It'd be the head of state of the country. They do it like a gift to their people. So they book the biggest artist in, that their country people are listening to and bring him in, the Acorn, Wycliffe. Then that used to be the black American artists. Then as we began to flip the situation and people listened to us, it started being our artists. And the first guys everybody was looking for was P-Square. Then no hits and the badge. And you know, from Indonesia, across Africa, the Middle East, London, and then into the States, that's how it began to build. But the Africa has a state, so Acorn is, I think it was in Uganda or something, it's 2008, nine, and he has to find a substitute. So he does a deal with P-Square and books them to come and perform for him. Once P-Square is announced in that country for the show, they sold 80,000 tickets immediately. 80,000? 80, yeah, 80,000. And P-Square came there, shut down the country for New Year's Eve, and that's what they do. And I'm telling you till tomorrow, any time you put P-Square in the stadium, they're going to shut it down. So, 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 so just, now let's, let's talk about stadiums mm -hmm. and infrastructure. Oh, yeah. It's sad to say that, as of now, the music industry is an export system. The guys make it outside. The big stadiums. Bonas is our biggest export in this era mm -hmm. with stadiums and all. In your lifetime, which, sta which stadium performance did you go to and forever is the number one you've been in your life? Let's ask that question first. Oh, Music. In anywhere in the world? In the world. Oh, Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson? Oh, yeah. Michael, it won't be till now. It's not even a question. Wait, 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 a which question. stadium? I saw Michael Jackson, Wembley Stadium in 1989. You remember till now? What are you talking about? Yeah, you have most people who be. Listen, bro, man. Listen, it, respectfully to all artists that have ever lived, and we've seen a lot of them, you know, the greatest artists of this era are great. Beyonce, Chris Brown. But to me, it's even laughable to mention them with Michael. It's my, they saw... They sold hundreds of millions of records. Congratulations. That's great. This is Michael Jackson. <laughs> it's a different thing. It's a different conversation. It's, it's, I don't know how to explain it. I will tell you this story. I'm in the stadium the first time we saw him. I only ever saw him that one time in concert. But a friend of mine had been calling me three days before that, can we go together to the show? I'm like, yeah, sure. And he's like, what time are you going? I was like, I don't know. The show the show is 8 p.m. I'll get there like, you know, 6, 6.30. I don't even want to see the person performing before Michael. So I'm going to get there as late as possible, make my way to where my place is in the stadium and watch the show. He's like, ah, that, no, I'm not focused. I said, what do you mean? He, goes, <laughs> he says, what do you mean? He says, he says that he met Michael at the airport yesterday. <laughs> I, said, I said, what do you mean? He goes, he said, bro, I was at the airport to meet the guy. I said, did he know? I said, no, I was with the fans. <laughs> so the next day, he was at the airport at 4 a.m. I'm telling you, with 30,000 people waiting for the place to be open. He stayed there the whole day from that 4 a.m. <laughs> he watched the show. He now flew on tour with Michael to three more cities in Europe. Michael doesn't know him. <laughs> I said, guy, this day, I mean, it's extreme behavior, but that's Michael Jackson. I mean, Michael Jackson, you know. So he's an outlier. Forever and ever. Man, listen. It's Michael. If you, take, if you add Jay-Z swag, right, and confidence, Buster Rhymes energy, right? Buster Bonner's energy. Let's yeah. match. Bonner's, Bonner's still got some way to go to match Buster. I'm just telling you. Get um, Chris Brown's dancing at its absolute best, right? Add the perfect vocals of an Aretha Franklin, Yeah. I mean, where am I going? I mean, just you're, for Mike. You still not really got Mike. MJ is a problem because MJ could kill you with the ballads, kill you with the dancing, kill you with any form of music he decided to touch. So if the guy does a rock song, he destroys the era. I mean, he was killing genres. 
Radio changed because of this guy. Television changed because of this guy. MTV wasn't playing any black artists. Not one. Michael Caine, he became the biggest artist in the history of MTV. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it's, I get it. I get it. He broke every um, barrier that existed for black music. Now, in Nigeria, you've been for some stadium acts by Nigerians. Mm -hmm. Who has been your best stadium act uh, anywhere in the world but, but by a Nigerian? Uh, uh, that's a tough question. I mean... So I'll give you four. Have you been to Fela Stadium? Oh, man. Listen, Fela Kuti... I've seen Fela Kuti live. I was, I was a shrine. I saw Fela Kuti live at Lucky Sun Splash. I was backstage with him in 1991. So yes, I've seen Fela. I mean, I'm privileged. I saw him at a shrine several times. A song that he still hasn't, they still haven't released called BBC, Big Blind Country. I saw the day he debuted the song. Because Davagra had just um, devalued the Naira, right? From 10 to 1 to 30 to 1. So think about today's rates. Right? <laughs> so we did devalue the Naira. So we went to Shrine to find out what Fela had to say. You know, Fela had a lot to say. And that was BBC, Big Blind Country. So you've seen Fela? Fela, you've, incredible. You've seen, you've seen Peace Square? Incredible. You've seen Banga? Yes, incredible. You've seen Bonner? Yes. I didn't even, before I even get to Bird, I talk about Daddy Shoki. Daddy Shoki? Yes. But was he on key? Just ask him. What? Daddy Shoki? Was that, on key? Let me tell you something. Think about this. When Glow launched in Nigeria, they launched Daddy Shoki on billboards. Think about that. Why? He's king of the streets. The Ajegune warrior. Are you joking? Daddy Shoki. Daddy, Daddy Shoki. You know, like, it's like Idris. It's that like Nigerians just dismiss these people. Like, I said, no, these people command millions of people. They represent them. So that, these are the authentic kings. I mean, yes, God is great, but Bernie still hasn't had the shows in Nigeria like Shoki. Do you get what I'm saying? When Bernie is able to tour 40 stadiums in Nigeria and do what he just did this summer worldwide, then I'll give him, but, then I'll elevate him to that. But the infrastructure in Nigeria can handle no, no, his sound. that's not true. That's not true. That's not, that's not, nobody lied to you. The sound is in Nigeria. The stages are in Nigeria. We have 400 state, we have 40 stadiums. We have 400 universities that have facilities, right? We have thousands of halls. What you don't have is promoters, right, who are ready to take the risk to build touring. Touring is not something built by, because what has been happening in Nigeria is brand promotion. Very different thing. So, you know, Glow Campus Storm or MTN Rave, they bring seven artists and they do one, one song that's not a concert, right? And, they, and that, in that experience, the consumer does not pay. So it perverts the relationship. I mean, let me, don't get it wrong. We built that 20 years ago so that, because in validating... I hear you. So, no, you have to validate, right? We yeah. used to, I, I always tell people, I say music or entertainment is show business. There was a time in this country, it's not that long ago, where you bring anybody local and you put them in front of a Nigerian brand and they used to act up. Like they're doing you a favor. Ah, Obi, I beg. You know, even with the biggest brands, I don't want to name them, but they would always defer to the foreign. Okay? But now it's different, man. Well, yeah, we earned the right. We earned the right. So you've got to pay now. But in, you've got to pay for the experience. Promoters have to deliver the experience to the consumer. Do you understand? So that the consumer is ready to pay, come and enjoy, and be safe and enjoy. So I think Afro Nation Lagos this Christmas, you will see that. Do you understand? Because they are promoters. They're not waiting for the sponsor to do the show. They're not beholden to that. They're building a format where you can come and see Burner perform for 90 minutes and give his full production, which is what everybody here has been cheated of, right? Yeah. Because you're go able to go to Echo Hotel, but that's an elite venue yeah. for very few people. Yeah. You want to be able to put those artists that are in Echo Hotel they're actually too big for the venue. I hear you. David, Wiz, Burner. They're, they're bigger. Ashake. Rema. Rema. They're big enough to fill stadiums. If you're selling out the O2 Arena in London, you can sell out 20 stadiums in Nigeria. Kesimbalogo, Abuja Stadium. Kesimbalogo is 6,000 people. There's nobody there. 8,000. 8,000. That's like when you can't. Oh, no. Kesimbalogo is the one in Sulu. 18,000. They can sell it easy. It's just a mindset and understanding the economics of that business. And that's a business, really, for me, it's about to start. 
live that. Yeah, live entertainment and domestic touring. There are people who have been, I mean, you're in this thing to an extent, you know that there are people who've been producing shows for 25 years, yeah. right? And, but it's just the mindset of, it's like the way people don't pay to go to bars and lounges, right? But the bars and lounges still make money. Do you get? Yeah. But now you have to pay to go to the concert. Look at that Burner concert you're seeing, or the Whisk Kid at the O2 Arena. The ticket's 350 pounds, or it's 180 pounds. Nobody's diminishing the talent. Nobody's saying, ah, it's too much. No, why is it too much? It's world class, right? So in your country here, it's going to be about value exchange. You're not going to price the same price as a London ticket. Of course. Well, the, well Echo Hotel does, actually. That's the funny thing, because it's super elite. But if you're coming to the masses and you're saying, instead of going to a co hotel, let me go and do National Stadium, or let me do TBS and sell 80,000 tickets, that's a different conversation. But only a very, very few can sell those tickets, right, to really fill the venue. So it's, it's a nuanced business, and the business has many levels and opportunities. There are artists who, I don't remember an artist called B.B. King, who's an old R&B Yeah. He used to do 300 shows a year. I mean, he's out of 360 days a year. He's performing 300 days, right? That's crazy. But that's the business. That's the business of music. Now, now, I've watched many podcasts, Apple podcasts, um, um, podcasts by um, uh, um, Revolt TV, Grammy conversations, and they call this thing Afrobeat. Mm -hmm. So they make Afrobeat now the, the name of the, the, the Nigerian music Exports. Mm. You know how we have um, we have petroleum. It's now Afrobeat. But for those who don't do what we call Afrobeat, it's a bit confusing. So, what is the future of the music export? Is it just the name Afrobeat or Afrofusion? What do you think in the, for the Gen Z, the, the Gen Z, the next guys? What is the concept? I think I think don't get stuck on names. On names. Just do hot stuff, right? If if it's hot. No one cares what you call it. But the truth of the matter is that Afro beats is the genre and the de definition that has exploded. So there's no reason to fight it. I remember when the name was being bandied about. Well, what we were all doing was hip hop, okay? And we used to have all kinds of names for it. Nigeria hip hop, Africa hip hop, African vibes. And none of them were really working. And a lot of it was to do with a very simple thing, that a lot of African music was classified as world music, right? So if you went into the world, in the old days, the way record stores were structured. World music, yeah. So you were, if you're Ajana world, Kijo, yeah, if you're world music, Isundo. yeah, you're with those guys, and then you're at the back of the store, right? So in the front of the store, I walk in the front of the store, I'm seeing R. Kelly, Pop, Jay Z, R. B, Beyonce, Total, Biggie, and say world music. Who's world music? Ajana Kijo, Labaja. I'm like, none of these guys are in the club. None of them are ever going to be on radio. We wanted to be in the club. We wanted to be on radio. We weren't trying to be roots and culture. That's great, but that's not what we were trying to be. We wanted to be front and center, urban, in the thing. And that's why hip-hop and Afrobeats are first cousins, because what we were doing was hip-hop. But when we domesticated it fully... Melody. Added African inflection, melody. plus melody, plus dance, and changed it from rapping about the AK-47 to rapping about palm wine or whatever we wanted to rap about, then it became organic. And that's awesome. how you arrive at Afrobeats. And it was just a function of people searching for names. A brand say gets the credit for the name, but the truth of the matter is Afrobeats is first cousin of hip hop and Afrobeats is a fusion music. That's what Nigerians do. We mix stuff up, right? Everything we touch, we affect it and we animate it and the music is the best expression of that. And you know the music needs no visas, it just goes. It goes. There's a name you didn't call in the moment. There's a name mm -hmm. you didn't call in the moment. And I want to just ask you your opinion about him in this journey, mm -hmm. One Day Cole. What about One Day? That One Day, was he a moment? Is he a moment? One Day Cole is institutional. I mean, One Day Cole, you know, when I first met him, he was called Ebony. Right? Ebony. Yeah, yeah, that's his name. That was his artist name, Ebony, right? And one day call, we recorded him, we put him on a record before Mo Hits did because he was rolling with Mo Hits, but we were feeling him. We we're like, I was like, man, this boy can sing. He was singing, he always be singing. And he wanted to be around singing. And he wasn't, he didn't have any songs yet. He was singing. And we're like, listen, I said, Jazzy, 
I, I had to convince Jazzy to do a couple of tracks for Ike Chuku. And I wanted one day on a hook. And same thing with Nato C a year before. So one day did a couple of hooks for Nato C songs. I know he's got this voice that people try to copy, but you can't copy that thing. And, you know, that's the thing. So there was a record called I Shall with Nato C and One Day Call in 2007, right? And this is before any One Day Call release. In fact, when we first recorded, I still have the tape somewhere. It's Nato C and Ebony, and Ebony is spelled with an I, right? His name got changed the next year, One Day Call, Black as Coal. You know, I know he used to be an incredible dancer. He still says he can dance, but I think I think I he added a bit too much weight. Sorry, one day, but but the thing about it is the guy had it and he still has it. So the vocal inflections he had, and he pushed more hits, right? Because more hits with Jazzy's energy and Jazzy's production, the band's energy, and one day with the melody, it was a rap. There was nothing anybody could do. It was like these guys were just bringing hit after hit after hit. And, you know, they used to come to my house 2 a.m. and play me these records. I'd be like, oh, God. I call my guys and man, these guys are gone. <laughs> we can't catch this. I mean, because there are moments you hear things and you know. If, you, if you've been in this thing, I heard, I remember the first time they came and played me um, Igwe, the record. By who? By the band. And that's one of their biggest records. And they played me that record. They played me Moboni Feli Feli. You know, those records, suddenly, these are records that you hear. I mean, even that, the first day I knew one day was going to be a problem was he had a record called Olo Lufe on a Mo Hits, on a Mo Hits um, compilation. They came, and they used to come, they'll perform this whole thing in my house. They literally perform the whole album. And I'm just looking at this kid thinking, hmm, one day was literally Wiz Kid before Wiz Kid. Yeah? He just didn't come out fully. That's it. Mono. Before we go on a break, I'm going to ask you to name three artists that, if they were in this era of Spotify, YouTube, would have been a problem globally. Three artists. Right now? Yeah. Oh, easy. Easy. Two-Face. Problem, huh? The band. Nado C. Problem. 100%. Problem. 100%. You see, when you got superior flows and rhythm and hits, I mean, Spotify, come on. Nato would be doing like 100 million streams. And that's my view. Because Nato was doing ridiculous access things with his music then. And we would be getting messages from like Lithuania. Oh, they're rocking. Somebody sent you a video of some festival. You see how you're seeing all these festivals now? Festivals have always been there in Europe. But in those days, some random DJ would be playing our music in a festival. And we hear Kenny Big Deal with 60,000 people in Poland, 70,000 in Australia but they didn't even know who the artist was to be able to reach to the artist to invite him to come for the show. Now with social media, everything changed. The minute you drop the record, if the record is hot, it's gone. So social media is the, is the big thing that broke everything apart for us because till today, there's no budget in Lagos to do what we want to do in the real sense, right? Nobody had. Nobody had. Listen, man. you talked about startup industries earlier. The, the startup industries are Afrobeats. That's the startup industry. So we'll go on a break now. Um, they give you a lot of data. So an artist can see the cities where I'm being listened to the yeah. most. So if I'm being listened to the most in any room, right, more than I'm being listened to in Lagos, then it tells me I have to put some more work in in Lagos. But, but right? Spotify, those guys don't give, like, states. They give country. They give country. But then it's also, yeah, but that's also because that's why you want more indigenous Platforms, platforms okay. that give you more granular, granular look okay. in terms of your domestic data. Because the reality of it is that, yes, the reason why people want the global streams is because of purchasing power. It's an economic thing. It's not that, oh, because you're streaming me in Enugu, I'm not happy. I want you to stream me in Enugu. I want you to stream me everywhere. The question is, are you on the platform? Do you get it? If you're on the Spotify premium or Spotify free, then it's not actually coming as money to me. There's ad-supported side of it, right? But the key thing is, in Africa, we still haven't solved the domestic platform issue. In Nigerians think it's about data, but Nigerian data is cheaper than any data on the continent. So it's not just about data, right? It's also about habits. It's about how you consume music and who's promoting and pushing. You ask yourself, how much activation is Apple Music or Spotify doing in Nigeria? Very little. Very little. Beyond a random billboard. Asset. Right? So who are the music 
platforms in Nigeria that are promoting. Very few. So I feel that what has happened and what continues to happen in Nigeria is we have grown these industries. We bootstrap them, a startup. They're still not fully formed. Okay, there's so many elements to be added on to make it fully robust, secure yeah. and robust. But then we take it for granted, right? That's the Nigerian way. So it's a pity, but we've taken it for granted. Any other country by now would have created events and awards celebrating the wins we've already had. There are no African artists except the Nigerian artists that have sold out these kind of venues. All the other artists from Africa that have done anything, have done on the folk music circuit, on the traditional music circuit, not in mainstream pop, not in R&B, not in hip hop, not in the club. That's what we brought to the table. That's what Afrobeats is about. It's the urban sounds of Africa. You can call it that if you want to. So people like all the Nigerian guys, some of the Ghanaian guys, all the guys playing in that space, the black British artists, and then of course the US hip hop artists, were all in the same conversation. Now, you own a platform, or you run a platform, Nigerian Idols. Mm. You've done it for many years. I don't own it or run it. I'm a judge on judge it. Judge on it, yeah. Yeah, but it's been going. I think we did three seasons now, but Nigerian Idol has come and gone in Nigeria. I've produced many of these things. Niger Sings created it Good. and produced it, right? So those are different because they're but, reality shows. But do you, do you think that the, the, the platform actually makes a superstar or it's just... Well, it's about the person, okay. right? Because... Winning a singing competition doesn't guarantee you anything except the fact that you won the singing competition. I have some money. Yeah, you just got, you got a platform in the sense that people can see you. That doesn't mean you're going to be a commercial star. That's a different journey. Completely. Of course. So if you go and look, I'll give you an example, right? Um, if you look at all the biggest artists that ever come at reality shows, it's really the person that won. It might be the person that came third. But the reason why... Artists win reality shows and artists are commercial success is two different things. A reality shows almost like a karaoke singing competition. To, win, to be an original artist, you've got to be, that's original music. It's, it's brand new. It's not, you're not singing somebody else's music. It's brand new. You've got to bring your personality and you've got to connect and find your audience. And that's a different journey. So now let's go back to commercial. So you've spoken about the journey. Do, do, do you know, I'm, I'm still shocked. Do, do you know how pretty you did Two Face? We went to the band. I said the band before I got to the band. I said P Square. To P Square, P Square. That. But he helped me to three. Yeah. Then we now went. But to, they're really four. So we, now we're in the Bonner Wiz Davido. Mm -hmm. Then there's Rema. Well, I think. Well, you see, like this. No, no. Let me let me give you my list. Okay. You're trying to give me your list, okay. right? Yeah. <laughs> so let's go like this, right? I'm just give you just seminal moments, and there's not any number to it, yeah. but seminal moments. So, Junior and Pretty, right? with the Pigeon, Fufu Flavor, 1992, that album, bringing that Pigeon English into hip hop and doing it on those beats. Okay. Big moment. I think there's a lot of other stuff that he showed in 96 coming out by Jay Wimbe, right? Big, big moment, big, big moment. moment. Right, you got Tribesman in 2000. LD. Tribesman in 2000, 2001. Yeah. Big around, moment. Around Tribesman is also Plantation Boys. Idris, right? Big with moment. Remedies, right? Plantation Boys and Two Face. But when Two Face goes off in 2004, everything changes, right? That's the first superstar coming. By 2006, Two Face is in a place of his own, right? Everybody else is just looking at Two Face. Like, 2007 is the year of P Square. P Square, I like dropping. No, 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 no. P Square, honestly, like biggest. But I'm going somewhere. So right. P Square and then. So, but at the same time, Mohits Mo is coming heavy. Wait, no, MI is coming right after NATO. So, Mohits, NATO goes big in 2008. MI goes big in 2009, right? Ice Prince as well, 2009-10, with a big Ole Kuhn. But and then, then, but you see, P Square, Mohits. It's kind of like 2007, 2010, they're dominating everything. And then the band flips out with Oliver Twist. Right? But as the band is flipping out all of a twist, Whiskey is arriving. So, so Whiskey is the first of this generation. Whiskey? He's the first. There's no arguments about this. That's why he's the first to sell out the O2. He's the first, right? Then you got David. Why do you like David? Just quickly. Why? Why? His energy. Okay. David refused to be denied. David is supposed to be the spoiled rich kid. He, he refused. refused. He just said, you know what? I'm doing this. 
And everybody laughed at the kid or thought, oh, no, he's a rich kid or whatever. But you know what? That energy, that desire, and that talent that he has has carried him for the last 12 years. And it's still going. He's having it, what, a massive year? I think 650 million streams already. It's wild. It's wild. So David, then we now have Bonner. Yeah, but even with that progression to Bonner, you have a bunch of other guys. Oh, yeah. That were coming, doing stuff, right? You have the Ortain sound, the Ortain movement. You know, I mean, Bernard has been on a non-stop rampage for four years. For four years. Right? Since African Giant. And then and we now have this it's a, guy. It's a glorious thing to see. He's, he's massive. Then yeah. we have Rema. Rema is like a rocket ship. But even before you talk about Rema, Ashake. Oh, I apologize. It's lonely on the top. It's no, I apologize. So I think Ashake, you know, you have CK, guys having these big, big moments. Moments. Well, but, but Ashake is, Ashake, is wild. Ashake, this weekend, he's going to sell out the O2. It's wild. And that literally means in the 14 months from me dropping his album, he's selling out the biggest arena in the UK. No, his, 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 his one is a bit, a bit... I think the other artists on the trajectory, like Ashake, is who? Odumodu Black. Are you serious? 100%. Why? I don't know. Quote me, man. In a year's time, let's after have the conversation. <laughs> you think so? I think so, 100%. I think Odumodu Black is one of the most authentic voices I've heard in the last 20 years. And the energy is insane. And he already has a style and a look. You know, in music, right, you've got to come with all the senses. Sound. Serious. Listen to me. Music, when you want to you know a music star, sound, style, right? The fashion. Do you understand? Wow. You have to, you have to affect all these senses to be a star. But he's called there, slap there, like he's... Where they? Kid it. I'm telling you, man. Oh, you think he's the guy? Uh, you're, well, you, you seem to know the songs. <laughs> <laughs> you seem to no, know the songs. No, it's that means. Just... Yeah, but you see, let me tell you, it's the energy, right? And, and the same energy I wow. see in Ashake, I see in Udumudu Black, I see it in Burner. Wow. There's a particular energy there. There's a vibration wow. in what they're doing, and it comes in the melody of their music. You don't even have to understand what they're saying. Something. Yeah, just watch the reaction videos. You see people they don't understand a word of what these guys are saying, but they're feeling it heavy. You know, Jay Haas is all over the Nigerian sound right now. He has a ridiculous record with Naira Mali. Wild. Look at the video. That TJ Omori guy is a criminal. They need to lock him up. <laughs> milking, he's milking. It's... No, no, the guy, the guy is, is beautiful to see because he's delivering an aesthetic that that's the level at which you want to see Nigeria. Yeah. That's how, I, that's how I want to see the fashion, the culture. I want to see it at that level. I don't want to see it here. I want to see it here. Up there. Yeah, and TJ Mori is one of the best of the best. You know, he's literally uplifting everything he does. So I'm like, when I see his work, I'm like, okay, I'm paying what attention. What next? And, and he's just, he's, he's going, he's going. Now, someone sent me a message and said, I should ask you, that aside Tiwa Savage or maybe Yemena Day, most women don't like do big the music. Globally, it's different. It's Beyonce. Beyonce is, is she's, 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 she's legendary. There's Adele. There's... No, globally, there's a, there's a million female there's a, artists. But in Nigeria, mm -hmm. it's a bit scarce. Why? It's tough. It's tough. First of all, it's not easy to be an artist, male or female. That's the first thing. Second thing, culturally, it's also tough. And it's expensive to be a female artist. You've got to change your hair every day. You've got to change the clothes. and change the makeup. So for management of any female artist, they will tell you, you're managing a guy. It's a very different thing. Managing female, plus you've got to protect the female. There's a lot of I stuff. Hear you. Yeah, but there are superbly talented female artists. Arista is who've a had beast. Many. Oh, Arista looks to me like, and not just her. I mean, they just put out a new female artist this week, Maven. She raps. Yeah, raps and sings. Looks like she's a problem. I mean, I, I think, look, I've been blessed. We worked with a few. You know, Sasha, incredible as a performer and as a person, right? Um, Omaomi, you know the voice, I don't have to voice. say too much, right? Even the events lady um, too, um, you know, YJ. YJ. of course. You know, I think about, I think about um, Tenny the Entertainer, right? I think about Miniola. I think about, um, what's this lady called? Um, Yemi Alade. But, I, but, but, but we must give, give it up for Thames. Oh, listen, Thames, Thames is, I mean, you know, it's weird how not weird, but Thames is much bigger outside Nigeria than she is in Nigeria. Yeah. Her sound seems to be a bit more mature. Um, and, you know, a lot of people feel she's like a new age Shadi. 
you know, she has that sound. And then the thing for me, the beautiful thing for me is to see her songwriting. Because that song she wrote for Rihanna and Lift Off is incredible. And, you know, that's the thing. When you can write a song like that, you can eat for the next 40 years. You don't have to be on stage every day. You don't have to be on Instagram every day. Because trust me, that one song, that one moment, <laughs> it's going to last forever. Now, let's bring it back to Obiasika. Mm. Back to you. Is there any mistake you've made in the, in, the, in, the, in the ecosystem of creativity that you wish you didn't make? Just, was there a person you made a sign you didn't sign? Let's, 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 let's. Man, there's a, there's, a, there's a thousand. Like who? <laughs> one mistake. There's a thousand. Listen. Just share one. Share listen, one. I'll tell, tell you a true story. Like, I mean, they don't know whether they're mistakes, but if it's, like, not, if it's about not signing artists, a million. I mean, Mohits were in my office for eight months trying to get me to sign them. I never signed them. Um, what? Yeah, well. Bobby. No, but you see. I forgive you. I forgive you, man. I forgive you, bro. No, but see, the thing is this, is that. That's life. Well, it's not, well, not that life, but we didn't feel we needed to sign them to activate them. So we activated them, right? So, okay, look, Jazzy, we're doing Big Brother Nigeria. You come and do the official theme song, right? You guys perform at the opening show. If we put you here, we're going to embed you here, right? We're doing this, we're embedding you here. We're doing this show with Channel O, the band you're hosting. No, Two Face, you're hosting. No, Peace Square, you're hosting. They're not my artists, but we're building a movement. Ecosystem. So we built everybody. So it wasn't about myself and Tola, I didn't see myself taking about 150 Nigerian artists onto Channel O at a time when no Nigerian TV channel was ready to play them. Because you know, we're funny people. We need external validation to see ourselves. Well, and I do you know, till now, it's still it, happening. It's, 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 a real, it's a real thing. It's a it's, real problem. Yeah, man. So guys would go, Clonized. they spent spe like a year and a half going to NCA or the radio station. The guy would say, no, what are you doing? Look, who are you? But then we'll get them on Channel O. They record the Channel O video, then they go to NCA, they say, I'm on Channel O. And NCA can't tell you you're nobody, right? So suddenly you got something. They're playing you on YFM in Joburg. I get the YFM guys to send you the clip. You can take that to your radio station in Enugu or Joss or Abuja, wherever you are. And also, don't forget, it's like validation. You be sitting wherever you're sitting in some little corner of Nigeria, even in Lagos. Nobody ever paid attention to you. People tell you they're going to support you, but then nobody's doing anything. You go to the radio station, you have no access. Do you understand? That's the reality yeah. of how this game was. So what we did was give everybody access. Everybody we thought had something to offer, we gave them access, try to give them a platform, put them on TV, put them on radio, put them in shows. It didn't even matter if there was any money because in the first instance, you have to be heard first, right? You can be saying, I'm great. This boy has great potential. But, be heard get, first. but if you're not going to be heard, yeah. nobody can even begin to think about, oh, because then the brand can go, you know, a guy, maybe we can't afford him, but let him come anyway. He can warm up the crowd. So a lot of the guys you see as superstars today, WizKid toured Nigeria, warming up for Banky W, for Atisalat in 2011. That's his first time going around Nigeria in 70 shows. That's how you get the discipline to perform. Because when people see these guys on Instagram flying all over the place, they think it's fun. It's not fun. They're not having fun. It's work. Because every time you fly, you know you deal with compression. You come off the plane, you're tired. You go and perform two hours, you lose 10 kilos. You go, <laughs> these are facts of life. You lose, that, you lose that weight, you lose the energy, and you lose the essence. Then you go back, and you have to go out. You have to smile at the after party. People think you're just having fun. But they don't know that the next three hours, you're going to get on another plane, fly six hours to another place, and do the same thing again. And the guys in the audience, they're not going to be there saying, oh, he performed yesterday, he's tired. <laughs> you, have to bring, you have to bring that same level energy. of energy every single same time. Same energy. So when you see the artists on tour, respect it. It's work. It's not... Because people always think, I said, they say, ah, they're just having fun. Really? <laughs> uh, they, had to, they had to rehearse. It's like a music video. You shoot a music video for three and a half days, sometimes in multiple locations. For five, for, th for three, three minutes, minutes, four minutes. And somebody's going to yap your video. <laughs> and say, ah, they were not original. Ah, they don't know what they're doing. Meanwhile, you wrote, you had a whole script, you had a whole team, you had a fashion team, you had a... But nobody sees that. They just see the artist. But if you go on a music video production, there's 70 people on the production. If you go on a, a live concert, there's 200 people working. And that's what the business of entertainment is about. 
The person in front is just the person in front. The people behind, everybody's there to make the person in front look good, yeah? But when it begins to really pay money, when all the guys on the set are getting paid, now you've elevated the whole thing. So I think domestic touring in Nigeria by 2030 can be worth a billion dollars per annum in Nigeria. Nigeria. And now, that's more interesting. Now, you, 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 we spoke about it. You're not doing stuff with the, with the, with the Digiverse and some, some stuff with them, AI and all that. And it has come, technology. The Nigerian median age is 19 years old. So 64% of Nigerians are below 25 years old. It's a young country. It's young. Um, I went to speak to teenagers on, f on Friday and Saturday. For real, they, they, they didn't know MI, they didn't know NATO C. They don't know them. At all. No, they don't. They don't know them. For uh, real. My daughter's 12, she doesn't know them. Thank you. So, so um, and there's no history. There's no, what do you think the young artists need to learn about the history? That's one. Two. What do you think will never change in music, the music business? What will never change? What will never change? I mean, listen, I'll let me flip it for you. The thing that will never change is we'll never stop being Nigerian, which means the essence of the Nigerian will always be in the music. And that comes with intentionality, attitude, inflection, vocal inflections, and style. That's what we bring to everything we do. So that's never going to change, right? In terms of what do you need to do about history? I think sometimes it's also about platforms, right? The reality of the thing, and I think you heard me say it the other day, is that we live in the attention economy. So people pay attention for two, two minutes, right? Snack bites, and then everybody's got that high. But if you look at life, even in the span of your life, and the things you've seen and things you've forgotten, right? It's about who can tell the story. Where are the storytellers? So it's not just about the history, it's the storytellers. Like you can tell stories in so many different ways. You can tell stories not just as podcasts, but with music. I tell people all the time that film, music, art, literature, poetry, those are all forms of storytelling. So if you were to watch my docu-series, Journey of the Beats, there's not much you would not know about Nigerian music and its evolution if you watch that. It's 10 episodes, there's a lot of history, but there's also a lot of stories but people always tell me they want to. Be, I said, listen, for me, I don't want anybody to go and make another docu series. What I'd love is somebody to go and watch that series and say, you know what, Idris Abdul Karim's story is incredible. I need to make his biopic. Or Rex Lawson is I, that's the guy I need to talk about, the king of high life, the reason the guy that Fela Kuti was scared of. You know, that, that, because the truth of the matter is, we failed as storytellers in this country both from the intentionality of government, intentionality of the education piece, and even from the media side. So what you end up looking at is, if you look at Nigeria, unfortunately, and you try to mention 100 prominent Nigerians, 100 prominent moments in the last 100 years, of which there have been many, you'll find that less than 10% have been recorded, even 5%. There are no biopics on any Nigerian. You know, there's no, you know, there's no biopic of Fela. And, also, you're talking about Fela. Sadona Zeke. I mean, there's no biopics of anybody. Right? Wild. So, and, you know, there's political, sporting, entertainment, culture, literature, life. There's nothing. And this is a big problem. As just biopics, there's no docus. There's no Wild. talk shows. Nothing. So at the end of the day, it's like we create this situation of blank. So why would you expect the kid to know that, oh, this person is dressed like this because of this person? If there's no connection, you can't validate what you're saying, right? So only because you lived it can you say, I can only say hip-hop and Afro beats because if you watch a hip-hop video, you can see there's no difference. You can see yourself visually. A kid can work that out. But to understand the transition, who's going to tell them? But the good thing about it, though, is that the kids grow up with no biases and no limits. So somebody who's 40, 45 never believed a Nigerian could sell out a stadium in the West. Nobody could be there. Yeah, but a kid who's 10 is growing up thinking it's normal. So that's, there's no limit, right? He's not being held back by the, the diminished thoughts of his I parents. Do you get what no I'm saying? Fears. No because, yeah, because a lot of Nigerians deal with self-reduction. That is not possible. 
Ah, no, no, we can't do it. It's self reduction. Why that? Please just, just, just stay a little bit. Why do we do it? Why? You know why? You're Nigerian. <laughs> Nigerians do it every day. Every day in social media and conversation. Self reduction. It's self reduction, yeah. Oh, it's not possible. We can't do it. Meanwhile, they've done it already. The Nigerians are doing everything. There's nothing on this planet Nigerians are not doing. There's nothing. I'm telling you, whether it's in medicine, whether it's in science, whether it's in everything. technology, education, in business, and governance, we do it all. Here we're talking about music and culture, but the reality of it is we do it all. The question is, are you allowed to do it? Do you have an environment in which you can make it happen? And the truth of the matter, I think, is that with or without government, we've grown these sectors, right? We've grown... Nollywood has grown without the government. Mm -hmm. Afrobeat, let's call it Afrobeat, has grown without the government. Nigerian comedy. Has just too funny. I mean, so what I'm saying to you is that if you look at Nigerian entertainment or, or Nigerian soft power, as I like to call it, and say all the influencers, the musicians, the Nollywood guys, the comedy makers, the, the football players, um, the athletes, the basketball players, all these people combined, they have easily a billion followers, right? The billion followers can command incredible products and leverage and money, right? So what is the missing link? The missing link is products and merchandise, right? And what is the missing link in products and merchandise? Is platforms, number one. Number two, trust. Okay, so if I'm Don Jazzy or if I'm anybody who's a big influencer, I need to be able to trust Abba that Abba can produce my 10,000 sneakers. And sell the world. Not Someone just, said that. Not just produce them, sell them and give me my money. Money. Someone said that if Bonner had won a Nigerian brand for his tour, Love That Mini Tour, he was, he's been able to, he was able to reach 5 million eyeballs. 5 million. Yeah, but listen, listen. Every time Burner or Wiz five million eyeballs. or any of these guys. You're talking about five million eyeballs. My brother. Burner. Champions League finals. Listen, listen, that's just one event. But look at it like this, right? If you go look at the top 10 streaming artists from Africa in the history of YouTube, eight are Nigerian. Talk about Flavor, who you don't think about as mainstream. But Flavor streamed over a billion views on his own channel on YouTube, right? That's the power. That power means that brands see that. They're not silly. So when Flavor's going on tour, a brand can say, hey, you know what? I'm life bay. I'm going with you. I'm going with you because I know 10,000 are coming everywhere you're going, right? Wow. So that's what we're talking about. It's like Diamond Platinum out of Tanzania. Wild. Yeah. Black coffee, wild. Yeah, but Diamond Platinum can't get into Nigeria to get the numbers. Do you get what I'm saying? He's not getting the numbers on Spotify. He's getting it on YouTube for the visual side, yeah? So there, it's just understanding that. And my piano is incredibly powerful, but it's not translating into streams on Spotify or Apple Music at the same scale, like that melody-driven Afrobeats. So Afrobeats is in that sugar spot. It's like that bad habit you can't get rid of. This keeps coming like that. Long may it last. Why are you complaining? <laughs> do, do you suspect that the, the West would own it? When you say the West will own it, suspect. It's not about suspect. I can tell you this for a fact, right? Who has invested in it? The West. So what are you talking about? So they don't own it, but we work with them. They control the levers of publishing and distribution. But the terms of these deals these days is not quite like the terms in the 50s and 60s. But the reality of it is that in Africa and in Nigeria, we're still paying lip service to these things. Banks are still telling you, oh, they don't have structure, so they're not funding, right? But you know, the same bank, right, is fully aware that Hollywood uh, is a banked industry. Do you understand? The music industry is driven by private equity finance, okay? Long term. The music industry, the film industry, the entertainment industry, there, there are models for financing IP. So when people, when people say, oh, there's no structure, I get very irritated. Because it's not that there's no structure, okay? It is the Nigerian lack of structure that affects the creative economy. It is not the creatives that are creating the problem. Because nowhere in the world does anybody expect the creatives to also be the distributors. And the, and the, it and doesn't the, happen. And the touring centers. And it's not no, no, the, no, the creative business is to perform. Create the content. No, it's to perform. They don't even have to create the content. The producer can create the content. 
the choreographer can design the show. But all those things are irrelevant if the star Cannot doesn't star. deliver, right? Yeah, yeah. So the star is at the apex of a team, and that's how it happens. But then what needs to happen is, where's the other elements? Because you're asking about local investment. What is it we want to see? What you want to be able to do is to empower Nigerians, right? The biggest opportunity in Nigeria and the biggest issue and opportunity Nigerians have is Nigerians. Our oil and gas, our cobalt, all the things that they say we have as mineral resources are not worth nearly as much as the Nigerian people. If we put even 5% of the money into the Nigerian people, what do I mean? You've got to upskill, right? You've got to give people, get people educated properly. And I don't mean university degrees. I get it. Relevant conversation, relevant I mean, tools. technical skills and tools. You can work remote. You can work all over the world. Business process outsourcing. Nigeria should be aiming for 10 million new types of jobs in the next four years, right? It's not, we have a big problem. And our biggest problem is jobs, right? And to change that, we're not producing nine to five jobs. But these industries, these creative economy industries can provide those 10 million jobs. If you skill up the people, right? Because they work fixed term economy. They don't work nine to five. Right? Any village you go to in Nigeria, the guy who's the photographer is making money. Yeah. Wedding, Sunday church service. The guy who's the event manager is making money because yeah. somebody's getting buried, somebody's being born, there's something, right? So all of those people are the providers of what you call the creative industries or the entertainment industry. And everywhere in Nigeria, they exist. It's just different levels of skill, right? But the opportunity to be seen so they can earn is a big gap. And then somebody to deliver at scale. Because in Nigeria, I think we're only graduating about a million people a year at a university. So we have 2 million falling off every year. In 10 years, it's 20 million. That's how you get to 60 million unemployed, right? So we have to do something urgent about that that will now drive the energy that feeds all of this. Because if it's the talent uh, in film, in television, in arts, in culture, in music, in literature, in comics, in animation, in gaming, the, art, the talent is everywhere. It's about codifying the talent so that you can monetize it. That's, what the, that's why the Saudis are investing, right? They're building, what they did is, okay, we don't have talent, we've got money. So what do we do? Let's invest in all the built brands because the whole world's attention is on the built brands. So if I own 10% of Instagram, you're always talking about me, whether, whether I say anything or not, right? So that's the strategy and it works. The West, the EPL is the biggest league in the world because they have the most money. Not just that, Sky Sports created the best product. So when you watch NCA and you watch coverage of our league, and you it's watch- It's a goal, it's a goal, it's a goal! It's different, man. No, if you watch that and watch EPL, it's, jury. it's a different thing. It's a different thing. Yeah. So it's not, it's, it's really just disrupting. We need to disrupt our own country, personally. That's my view. Because, you know, I think everybody knows we haven't done as well as we could do as a country. You know, we, we, can't, we have a great heritage, but even like you said, the kids don't know um, the bands and MI. How would the kids know what Nigeria did in Africa? How would they know? How would a kid know that Nigeria, do you know that Nigerians paid income tax to the South African Development Fund for 27 years? Would you know that? Have we told the story to anybody? Do you know that Nigeria formed the Anti-Apartheid Commission in the UN in 1972 and chaired it from the beginning to the end? The Nelson Mandela's first flight when he was released from prison out of South Africa is to Abuja to say thank you because the biggest supporter is Nigeria. So if we don't know, if you don't tell the story, who's going to know? So why do you think South Africans have issues with us when we don't tell who we are? Do you get what I'm saying? So we have, storytelling is a superpower, but we don't use it. And when you look at the Africa, they talk about Africa, the land of the storytellers, the griots. I'm like, really? We don't value the story. If we value the story, you wouldn't be waiting for Disney to come and tell your fables. Shango would not That's... be broke outside Lagos and Thor's worth $100 billion. Kai. But if Thor and Shango fights, who wins? Shango every day. <laughs> That's biased. Man. No, I'm not, because he's older. <laughs> Shango came first. Why is he going to lose? If you have a younger cousin who's less good looking and a lighter shade of you, what would you do? Beat him, eh? Anyhow. So I mean, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding, but, but you get the point. The point. I do. The point is that 
I do. Everything it has always sat with us, right? I mean, you're about to allow me to talk about the omniverse, but you know, can I talk about that? Yeah. Why not? Tell me. End with that. I said, end with that. Are we ending now? You're ending. Okay. Yeah. So the omniverse is basically a new platform we're launching, right? Where we believe that collaboration is a superpower. That a lot of the stuff that holds us back in Africa and on the continent and in the black world is a lack of collaboration. So we have a lot of talented people doing a lot of things. They're operating in different silos, right? So we're thinking, how do we bring them together? And what are the themes we can use to bring them together? So the underlying theme is that technology and innovation, if applied to almost any sector of human endeavor, scales whatever you're doing by X10. So whether it's education, whether it's governance, whether it's healthcare, agriculture, fintech, banking, media, entertainment, applying technology to these things in terms of platforms scales everything. X10. So that's what the Omniverse is about. We're going to bring everybody together. So it's a collaborative hub. Yeah, collab collaboration, convergence, and economic development. Because we feel like when you talk about all the talent we have, and talent, I believe, is the superpower of Nigeria. Nigeria can power the entire world. We have so many people. We just got to put them to work. Do you understand? So our talent can easily generate $200 billion a year sitting in Nigeria. They don't have to go anywhere. That's what we need to unlock. And that's what the Omniverse is focused on. We're focused on that, that conversation. So we're launching in November, Landmark. Everybody's invited. Pop Central are a partner. They don't even know that yet. <laughs> <laughs> Omniverse. <laughs> The future. Obi, thank you, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. I made you miss your Liverpool Chelsea game. Let's just pray we got the right result. Yeah, man. But if not, all of is it? Did, did Liverpool lose? Game over. Final one one. Game. It's just fine. So it's, it's fine. It's fair. I didn't um, die. I um, didn't die. It wasn't that bad. My last question for you today is, who is your favorite Nigerian artist and why? Mm -hmm. And let me close it. Woo. And it's on record, so that I'm going to cut this clip and put it on Instagram. And, <laughs> and that's how I'm going to push this. Like you're going to put me in trouble, man. Yeah, I'm going to do that. And why? I mean, listen. I think when I was eight years old, nine years old, I came back from England to Enugu. And um, a friend of my father's, who's late now, his name was Professor Uku Ai Uku. He sat me down, very serious. He was, he was looking very serious, and he said to me, why, 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 um, what's your favorite, the same thing, who's your favorite artist? And I brought up some random artist from the UK, a guy called Shaking Stevens, who was like a wannabe Elvis Presley out of the UK. And Shaking Stevens was having a big summer. That was the guy in my head, right? And he, and he was so disappointed, and he said, Shaking Stevens. Shaking Stevens, even the name sounds funny. Yeah. Shaky, sounds shaky. I'm telling you, he just dismissed me. He said, listen, I suggest you go and listen to Fela Kuti. That there's a song called Gentleman. Don't listen to that song. Let's discuss it. I was eight or nine. I went and listened to the song. So today it remains one of my favorite songs. And when I think about the different phases of Fela, I think Fela is the most powerful musician possibly born in this century. Him and Bob Marley. Just, you know, I have a phrase that I, I like to believe I coined it. I don't know if anybody else did it before me. I'm here. Fela is hip hop. Yeah. For nice hip hop. Yeah. I used to do for nice hip hop Friday nights at the shrine and take all the rappers down to go and perform. And to me, for nice hip hop, before hip hop even existed, because hip hop is about energy and attitude, it's about revolution and disruption, it's about philosophy and lyrics. And that's for nice Kuti, right? And to me, the lyrics and the music are even more important than the rhythm and the beat a lot of times. So I'll, I'll stick with Fela. That's the f safe call. It's safe. It's safe. Thank you so much, Asika. Thank you. Yes, sir. It's Thank you.